you have an aspect of your being that is immortal. That wasn't that is not limited to the earth school that was not born and will die, but that existed before you were born and will exist after you die. In the West, that's called the soul. It is a multi-sensory perception that informs you in ways that are meaningful, that there is more to your life than you might have thought before, that there is more to you than you might have thought before, a great deal more. And as you begin to look at what the pain and the bliss in your life are both, both showing you and realize that it's not showing you anything about the world, it's showing you about yourself. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dreamcatcher podcast a place where your dreams can find a voice. I'm your host, Celine Chinoy. Thank you to all of you who return every week to tune in to become a better version of yourself. Make sure you hit subscribe if you haven't already and rate our show if you enjoy this episode. The human species is evolving into a new phase in which we retreat from external power based on what we perceive with our senses and towards embracing internal power based on our spiritual identity. My guest Gary Zukov says that each of us can be part of this evolution and become the authority in our own lives when we embrace certain values of the soul. He'll explain what those values are in this conversation. Gary Zukov is the author of four consecutive New York Times bestsellers, including The Seed of the Soul, which captured the imagination of millions, becoming the number one New York Times bestseller 31 times. Zukov's gentle presence, humor, and wisdom have endeared him to millions of viewers through his many appearances on The Oprah Winfrey Show. Six million copies of his books are in print, and translations have been published in 24 languages. Zukav grew up in the Midwest, graduated from Harvard, and became a Special Forces officer with Vietnam service before writing his first book. Gary will share his wise insights, which will change how you see the world, interact with other people, and understand your actions and motivations. This will enliven your everyday activities and relationships with meaning and purpose. Hello, Gary. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's a beautiful day where I am. And mostly I'm fine because I have had a good morning of looking at what my experiences are and being able to decide whether what I'm feeling in my body and feeling and seeing in my thoughts is coming from love or is coming from fear. And yeah, I know. And that is one of your fundamental teachings, isn't it? I wouldn't say it's my fundamental teaching. <laughs> I would say that it is the fundamental way of looking at your life if what you choose to become in your life is more creative more compassionate, more connected, more caring, more vital, and more in love. If you don't care about those things, then of course you can continue to do what you're doing. But eventually that will produce so much pain in your life that you'll begin to look for an alternative. And that alternative is what people almost always call the spiritual path. Right. Yeah, I mean... That's a beautiful way to start our interview, Gary. And I just want to say that it's teachings like this that really impacted my life in a profound way. I mean, first of all, I'm delighted and honored to have you on the show. And your book, Seed of the Soul, was one of the first spiritual books that I read when I was around 18 years old. And it has become a staple source of guidance for me for the next 20 years. So I want to start by really thanking you for the profound impact you've had in my life, and I'm sure like thousands of other lives. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. 
All right, Gary. So I want to start by asking you about the impact that this book has had on the world. It's been 35 years since it's been published. And I want to know how you feel about how the book has affected so many people's lives. How do you feel about it when you think about its impact? Well, if I think about it, I can't feel it. If I feel it, I can't feel what other people are feeling. I can only feel what I'm feeling. And what I'm feeling <laughs> varies a lot. Joyful. And by joyful, <clears throat> see here you we're, we're beginning to talk about emotions. And that's very important. You can't create real power without your heart. And that means that emotions are important to creating authentic power. So what does an emotion? What is an emotion? Well, it's a feeling. Everyone uses that word for emotions. But what do you feel? Well, most people will say, I feel happy. I feel down. I feel depressed. I feel ebullient. But those are just titles. They're labels. They don't say anything about what you're feeling. Those are, um, when someone speaks in that language, they're emotionally illiterate. But when you can look inside yourself in certain areas of your body and see what you're experiencing in terms of physical sensations, then you'll be able to be emotionally literate. Let me give you an example of emotional literacy. When you're feeling anything, you can put, whether you think it's love or you think it's fear, you can put your attention into, let's say, these three areas, your your throat and your solar plexus area and look for physical sensations for example throbbing aching contracting burning stinging stabbing and if you're in a frightened part of your personality or in an energy of fear those are the kind of physical sensations that you'll that you'll find and if you look at the thoughts that this part of your personality is thinking they'll always be comparative and judgmental, like, a, oh, this is so simple, I know all of this, or this is way beyond me, I don't even know why I'm here, or uh, she's so stupid, or I'm so stupid. These are the kind of thoughts that frighten parts of your personality think. So, now to get back to your question, when you're experiencing, what you're experiencing in these three areas of your body, you're throat, chest area, and solar plexus area in terms of physical sensations, and you can describe it. For example, I'm feeling a stinging or a stabbing sensation in my upper right chest, and I feel a constriction uh, in my throat just above my chest, about the size of a ping pong ball, and it hurts. Or I'm feeling uh, a pain in my upper left shoulder, or I feel a burning all through my solar plexus. Now you're emotionally literate. Now you can say, this is what I'm feeling. And it's meaningful, substantive, helpful, and necessary for you to begin to move beyond the control of these parts of your personality. So now, back to your question again. What am I feeling? What am I feeling about what other people are feeling. That's not really the issue for me. The issue is always what am I feeling? Is it coming from love or is it coming from fear? And I want to suggest that that's always the important issue for you because, because if you discover that what you are feeling comes from love, and that means good feeling sensations in the same areas, thoughts of gratitude, appreciation, caring, and contentment. If you're feeling those things, then what you are feeling comes from love. And if you act on that, on those, then you are going to create constructive, positive, healthy, vital, good feeling experiences. And if you discover that you are in a fearful part of your personality, and you act on that, you will discover that you will create the opposite, painful, destructive, 
unhealthy experiences. So your question has opened up everything having to do with spiritual development. That means the heart, your emotions, using your body, using your uh, your body somatically to determine whether you're in love or fear. So that you can decide to challenge the fear if that's what you're feeling and avoid creating painful consequences for yourself. Or you can choose to act in love while you're feeling the fear and choose constructive consequences for yourself. And all of this has nothing to do with what other people are feeling. What other people do and what you encounter in the world activates dynamics in you. And those dynamics create your physical sensations, painful or pleasing. And that enables you to act either in a way that will create and contribute love to the world or fear, pain to the world. You know, you talk about emotional awareness and this propensity to walk towards love versus fear um, uh, in your book. And you say that is a characteristic of a person who is multisensory. In my experience, before I began to uh, look at myself as a person who would like to become aware and free of the painful physical sensations that control me so often, yep. I did not have a propensity to walk for love. I had a propensity to be angry, jealous, addicted to sex, macho, uh, impatient. In other words, I had a propensity to act on fear. Right. If you don't know where your intention is coming from, that means you your intention is unconscious, it's coming from fear. Mm -hmm. And most people live that way. Their lives are painful and they don't know why. And when their lives are painful, they try to change the world because they think the world is the reason they are feeling pain or the reason they are feeling bliss. But it's not. The world activates dynamics in you that create these. So my experience was for most of my life, well, half of my half of my life, a propensity, not a propensity, a compulsion toward fear. Things made me angry. I felt jealous. I felt resentful, competitive, inferior, or superior and entitled. But it wasn't until I had the commitment and the intention to grow spiritually that I began to see the dynamics and experience the dynamics in me so that I could choose to move beyond frightened parts of my personality when they control me or cultivate loving parts of my personality when I feel them. That's spiritual development. That's the development of mastery. So if you want to develop the ability to naturally be drawn toward love, then experiment with some of the things that we're talking about. Now, I'm saying that not, of course, just to you, but to everyone who's listening to us. And Gary, how were you able to make that shift in your life? Incrementally, you can go to our website, which is uh, seatofthesoul.com. It's named after the book. And you will see there um, different different tools to support you in growing spiritually. One of them is the Authentic Power Guidelines. I think they're on the website. If not, there's a course called the Authentic Power Guidelines. But the Authentic Power Guidelines simply help you to see, answer your question. How do you create authentic power and how does it start? You have to have commitment. You have to have courage. You have to have compassion, and you have to be able to communicate consciously. I've been doing my best to communicate consciously with our listeners, as you've been asking me questions, by answering in ways that I hope will be the most helpful for them to experiment with, 
rather than by chatting and telling you that the weather here in Ashland, Oregon is gorgeous today, it is. But the more important thing is, what's the weather inside you? Is it often turbulent, cloudy, stormy, gray, overcast? Is it sunny? Is the breeze blowing gently? Or is it hurricane force? What's the weather in you? That's determined. That determines. <laughs> By looking at the weather in you, you can see whether you're in fear or you're in love. And if you're acting from fear, from the turbulence, from the overcast, from the stormy energy, you're going to create painful consequences for yourself. And that's what you will contribute to the world and others. And if you decide to cultivate the weather that is gentle, nurturing, supportive, you will contribute that to the world, to others, and to yourself. In other words, we're talking about mastery, how to create mastery in your life, rather than blown about in your life, like a leaf in the wind, or a twig being swept down the stream, bouncing off rocks all along the way. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of people in our society are feeling like that. They are feeling like that leaf being tossed in the wind, and they're feeling increasingly disconnected, anxious. Most people are in pain, and there's a reason for that. We are living, by we, I'm talking about everyone that's watching, everyone that was born on a certain day and will die on a certain day. We are living, we were born into an educational, an educational environment. Let's call it the Earth School. The Earth School is this time, is this place of time and space and matter and duality. And it has one purpose, to help us learn to love. But it's not going to come like grace. It's not going to fall on us like rain. We become aware of what we are experiencing by what we are feeling. And as we try to avoid what we are feeling, to ignore it, repress it, suppress it, we continue to create the same, more pain and more of those same feelings. But when you decide that you want to change your life, that's when your life will begin to change, and not before. You can live an unconscious life of creating with fear month after month, day after day, lifetime after lifetime. The Buddhists call this the will of suffering. They call it samsara. And it continues until you decide to use your consciousness and your will to look at yourself and what you're feeling inside instead of at the world and trying to change the world that you begin to change. And then what happens? You begin to experience all of this fear, which means all of this pain. And then you're on the spiritual path. It's not a path of crystals, crucifixes, holy books, scriptures. These things can help if you're using them consciously, not if you're using them as distractions or a way to make yourself feel superior to others. Use your life consciously and you will discover what a miracle it is, what a powerful blessing it is, even though it's painful. Many times it's very painful. But that pain has a reason. That pain, that emotional pain, which is physical pain, brings your attention to a part of your personality that prevents you from giving the gifts you were born to give. And you can't give the gifts you were born to give while you're in fear, while you're angry, jealous, competitive, resentful, in the addictive control of sex or food or drugs. And giving the gifts you were born to give is where your joy comes from, where your meaning comes from, where your freedom comes from. 
And all of that is yours to learn in the art school. But no worries, as they say in California, you'll have plenty of opportunities. They will never end because the art school is a gracious gift from the universe. The universe is a loving universe. It's not one that's vast and expansive that started with a big bang and will end with a little whimper, or however it's projected to end. All of that is, let me put it this way, nonsense. Why do I use that term? I wrote a book on quantum physics that won the American Book Award for Science. So how could I possibly say all of that is nonsense? I'm using that in the literal way. <clears throat> a new consciousness is reshaping our entire species. And that new consciousness is not limited to the five senses, to what we can see and hear and touch and taste and smell. All of the old consciousness is limited in that way. And its understanding of power is the, line, is the ability to manipulate and control. And if something can't be seen or tasted or touched or smelled or heard, it's nonsensical. It's nonsense. It doesn't exist from that old consciousness. Well, all the things that I've been telling you, or many of them, are nonsense from that point of view. The new point of view is the new consciousness that's entering thousands of millions of individuals. And that new consciousness brings your awareness to the possibility or to the reality that you are more than a mind and a body. That when you have a question such as, I think I'm more than a mind and a body, that's a multi-sensory question. And I want to suggest to you that you have an aspect of your being that is immortal. That, wasn't, that is not limited to the earth school. That was not born and will die. But that existed before you were born and will exist after you die. In the West, that's called the soul. Mm -hmm. Hindus call it Atman. Yes. What would the Buddhists call it? Probably something like your original face. But it is a multi-sensory perception that informs you in ways that are meaningful, that there is more to your life than you might have thought before, that there is more to you than you might have thought before, a great deal more. And as you begin to look at what the pain and the bliss in your life are both showing you, and realize that it's not showing you anything about the world, it's showing you about yourself. Mm -hmm. And that if you really want to change, you need to look inside at yourself and change what you find there. Ah, now, now you're on the path to power. That means love. And how do we tap into the wisdom of the soul, Gary? By becoming aware of what you are feeling in just the ways that, that we've been discussing, uh, looking inside your body when you feel that maybe someone has betrayed you, for example, or you don't like the way that someone spoke with you, or you feel impatient and someone's not understanding what you want and you want them to understand and you're frustrated. Look inside yourself. Most people try to change the person or the one who betrayed them or the world that doesn't create permanent change. The most that is pursuing external power, the old power, the power of the old consciousness, the ability to manipulate and control. And you can do that. Everyone does when they're acting from fear. Suppose you are looking for a boyfriend and you find just the right person, and he feels that way about you. Now suddenly, you're feeling very good. It's like being on the top of a roller coaster. And then 
you're with that person for a few weeks or a few months, and then that person says, mm, this isn't working out for me. Uh, I, I really don't want to be with you. In fact, I found someone that I really do want to be with, and I'm leaving now. I'm going to be with her. And now suddenly you go crashing down to the bottom of the roller coaster and everything falls apart. The most that you can obtain from pursuing external power is that temporary feeling of happiness. Happiness depends on what occurs in the external world. Happiness is dependent on the world. But when you create authentic power, you activate something else, joy in your life. And joy is not dependent on anything. When you begin to create joy, it's a uh, it's like igniting a sun, a little sun inside you, and that sun grows larger and larger and larger. And as you move toward that, you're moving toward meaning. You're mo moving toward connection with other people. You're moving toward appreciation for other people. And that happens at the same time as you are moving toward appreciation of yourself. You can't love other people if you don't love yourself. And when you are controlled by frightened parts of your personality, you don't love yourself at all. You hate yourself. You loathe yourself. So at the heart of what we're talking about is this. Well, there's several, but one of them is your personality is a wonderful thing to look at. It's not a single thing, like I just said, it, uh, that was my misspoke. It has many parts. It's like a mandala. It has some parts that are, as we talked about, uh, jealous, resentful, competitive, impatient, angry, insecure, and needing to please, feeling superior and entitled. All of those we can put in one basket and call it fear. Everything in the fear basket, all of those experiences have a couple of things in common. They hurt when you experience it. And when you act on those things, you create painful consequences for yourself. Now, your personality, your personality also has many other aspects that are not in the fear basket. We experience them as gratitude, appreciation, caring, contentment, patience, awe of the universe. And they also have a couple of things in common. They feel good. They're blissful. And when you act on them, you create consequences for yourself and others that feel so good and are constructive, and you want to create more of them. So as you look at your experiences, you begin to be able to say to yourself, or if you have a spiritual partner, someone who, who can ask you, do you think what you just said come, came from love or came from fear? Not because you're judged if you come from fear or you come from love. The universe doesn't judge. It doesn't look in terms of good and bad, better or worse. It sees, if you want to say that, in terms of cause and effect. Every cause has an effect. Mm -hmm. And if you participate in the cause, you will participate in the effect. Now, what are the causes? The causes are, in the herb school, love and fear. Mm -hmm. And you're always choosing between those two. As you become aware of these things, and you may be becoming aware of them for the first time as you're hearing me discuss them, or you may become aware of them for the first time as you did as you were reading The Seat of the Soul, but now perhaps beginning to look with more depth and clarity at what was at what you resonated with when you read The Seat of the Soul. And I would suggest <clears throat> to all of our listeners and viewers that you not take anything that I'm saying as true just because I say it. But if I say anything that you resonate with, Ah, experiment with that and see what it produces in your life. 
And if you like it, experiment some more. That's what you have a life for. And if you don't resonate with anything, let it go. Don't try to wear a shoe that pinches. I'd also recommend that you don't take anything that anyone says is true just because they have a congregation or a television show or they've written some books. Do the same thing. If you resonate with anything you hear or see or say, experiment with it in your life because that's the life you have to create with. That's the life that was given to you. It's precious. And you're not going to be able to change the world at all until you can change yourself. Mary, how do we stay true to these principles that you talk about when we're dealing with <clears throat> difficult people, people who are coming from fear, or it's a difficult boss or a partner who's in a mode of conflict? How do we stay in that space of love and stay connected to uh, our soul compass when we are help. dealing with such individuals? Well, if you're arguing, you're in a frightened part of your personality. You are in a power struggle. A power struggle is simply frightened parts of one personality conflicting with frightened parts of another. It's always painful and it's always destructive. And the most difficult thing I have found to do <clears throat> is to end the power struggle in me, not to need the last word, have the last word, talk louder, be more reasonable, withdraw, become weepy, become hurt. All of those things are manipulations. Trying to manipulate what? Someone else, the world. But when you realize that the person that you are feeling is difficult, is in pain. That person is acting from a frightened part of his or her personality. And that's always painful. Yeah. When you realize that, then instead of judging that person, you begin to have compassion for that person. Because you know how painful it is to feel like you've got to make your point. To feel like you've got to be bossy. To feel like you've just got to control someone or something. Because your life is in control. And if it's an employee or it's a partner, you're not thinking about them. You're not thinking about anything except yourself. That's fear. And it's hurt, hurtful. It's destructive. Yeah. And it's not, by the way, it's not negative. There is learning in this. Yeah. No matter what you choose, to react from fear or to respond from love, you can learn from it. So can we stand up for ourselves from a place of love? Love doesn't have judgment. Love doesn't have boundaries. Love doesn't have fear. So what you're saying is, when I don't, when I have boundaries, fear, and judgment, how can I love? How can I act from love? You can't. But what you need to do is to find those parts of yourself. If you want to act from love, this is what you need to do. This is not a should. This is practical. If you want to act from love, if you're tired of trying to control, if you're tired of feeling that you need to stand up for yourself, then you're going to need to look at your emotions and what is behind them. What is behind them is pain, and what is behind the pain is fear. Let me give you an example. Let me, this is not an example. This is something you can consider. Everyone at the core of everyone is pain. Call it the pain of powerlessness. The, the pain of powerlessness is the pain of not being good enough. The pain of feeling that you want to be loved, but you're not lovable. The pain of wanting to love but you don't feel that you can love. It's the pain of wanting to belong and not belonging. It's the pain of being, it's, it, it's not wanting anyone to look inside you and be able to see inside you the way you see yourself because they won't want anything to do with you. It's the feeling of being inherently flawed, intrinsically. And that correct. is what gets in the way. 
what you're saying. That is the pain of powerlessness, and yes. everyone has it. Whether they're five sensory, which means they have the old consciousness yet, or whether they're multi-sensory, which means a new consciousness is emerging in them. Five sensory humans attempted to change the world when they experienced the pain of powerlessness. They try to change the world. If a child dies, they conceive another. If a business fails, they start another. If a relationship unravels, they look for another. This is the pursuit of external power. Multi-sensory humans do not look to the world when they feel the pain of powerlessness. They turn their attention away from the world and into themselves. They look at the dynamics inside themselves, just as we've been talking about there. They use the two tools of creating authentic power. Emotional awareness, which means what are you feeling in your throat, in your chest, and your solar plexus area? And if the physical sensations there are painful, you're in fear. And if the physical sensations there are pleasing, the kind you want more of, you're in love. And then you choose what you're going to act from in that moment. And you choose to act from a loving part of your personality while you're feeling the pain of a frightened part of your personality. Because you don't have to always act from parts of your personality that come from the fear basket. You've got many parts. And a lot of them come from the love basket. And when you choose the love basket instead of the fear basket, while you're feeling the pain of one of those parts that comes from the fear basket, now you're on a spiritual path. That's what takes commitment. Because you need to want to do this. It's, it's, it, it's satisfying to blame someone else for what you're feeling. But it never solves anything. That's another way of saying it never changes you. And your pain is coming from you. So if you want to love, look inside yourself. I'll suggest that boundaries come from frightened parts of your personality. The very idea that there's boundaries. This is the United States of America, and you don't dare enter it without a passport, because if you do, the consequences are going to be severe. Right. We're going to hunt you down. You don't dare enter. You don't dare cross our boundaries. If that's the fence around your property, that's my property. It's not your property. And if I leave something behind, like a pair of gloves, you don't dare pick it up and take it because you've crossed a boundary. All of those boundaries, the very idea of boundary comes from fear. It's the opposite of love. Love includes. Love accepts. Fear excludes. Love rejects. So whenever you find yourself rejecting, saying, I've got to stand up for myself. So you just stay over there. Here, can you see my hand, how big it is in the camera? That's what you're saying to somebody. Stay over there. You don't belong over here. Well, as you begin to see more and more about your life, you begin to see that you are deeply related to everyone in your life, even those you're judging. Those you're judging can begin to show you what is preventing you from seeing the deep relationships that you have. I hope this is helpful in some way because you're talking about the most important things that we can talk about. Yes. Love and fear and your life and how they're related. One last question, Gary. What role does our intuition play in all of this? Because I know you dedicate a whole chapter to it and its importance in uh, tapping into uh, our soul. Yes, to all of those things. Intuition is the voice of the non-physical world. Intuition is an experience that is a part of the new consciousness. The old consciousness, individuals with the old consciousness, now and then would have an intuition. I shouldn't, I should check the brakes before I drive. Oh, I think I left the house unlocked. I'm going to go back and check. 
But five sensory humans look at intuition as a, an oddity, a fluke. Multisensory humans know that intuition is the voice of the non-physical world. You can communicate with wisdom through your intuition. Your intuition is like a radio receiver, and it receives different stations. One of those stations is your own soul. You ask, for example, earlier, how can you tap into the wisdom of your soul? Here's, a, here's one way. Before you speak or act, if you don't know your intention or you're not sure of your intention, ask yourself, what is my intention? And you will not be alone in your answer. Your intention will be either love or fear. It will be either to cultivate love or to push someone away, which is, which is the opposite. Another radio station that your receiver can um, pick up and tune into are souls in advance of your own. And they can be very helpful, especially if they're wise and compassionate. As sometimes grandparents can be because they've lived long enough and hurt long enough that they can begin to become generous and compassionate. Not all, but that can happen. But we're talking about cultivating that until it becomes your life. Compassion, love, acceptance. Other stations that your radio receiver that we're calling intuition and tune into are non-physical teachers. That's with a capital T. These are sources of compassion and wisdom that are beyond what we can give to one another. They are priceless. As we become multisensory, and that means our entire human species, we begin to communicate with non-physical teachers. We begin to see that non-physical reality is just that. It's a reality. But it's not non-physical. It's not physical, like the Earth School is physical. But in this Earth School, which is not separate from the universe, we learn how to create love. We learn what parts of our personality are attracted to the Earth, you might put it that way, to a better house, nicer hair, bigger car, good-looking friends, education, big home, or great sandals. And which parts of your personality are reaching toward your soul, toward meaning, toward fulfillment, toward giving, toward the joy of being a part of something larger, the world, others. This is all the spiritual path. And that is where intuition fits into it. Intuition is part of the new consciousness. Uh, and if you are interacting with someone who has the old consciousness, which, by the way, is not inferior to the new consciousness, it's just a temporary ebb and flow yes. of evolution. Mm -hmm. But if they are controlled by a frightened part of their personality, they might judge what you're saying. If they're very polite, they might just think to themselves, that's nonsense. If they're not polite, they might just tell you that's nonsense and speak from a frightened part of their personality and create destructively. And if they're very frightened, if they cannot bend, if they're so rigid, they feel they will break if they try to bend, that is called a fundamentalist. A fundamentalist is terrified of life, so terrified that it cannot, he or she cannot tolerate anyone who does not think, see, dress, or believe, or speak as he does or as she does. This person is dangerous because this person does not revere life. But this person is in intense pain, and you can see that when you're multi-sensory, and that will begin to develop compassion in you for him, no matter how brutal he is or she is, because he or she is showing you a part of your personality that is also rigid 
brutal, unbending. Well, that is so own, profound. Yes, isn't it? Isn't it really? And as you find in yourself the parts of yourself that are as brutal, as uncaring, as rigid, your judgment of this other person will begin to lessen and eventually your heart will melt because you will have experienced what he is experiencing from the inside. And you will, that's called compassion. It doesn't mean you run up and hug somebody who wants to put you in jail or hit you over the head with a stick. It means that you can use that experience to create authentic power in yourself. And now, perhaps, you can see even more clearly why it takes commitment and courage and compassion and conscious communication and actions to create authentic power. Sometimes the best thing you can do is be quiet, be silent. But what is your intention? People can choose not to speak to make a point of superiority, or they can choose not to speak because they feel in that moment that might help the other person the most. One comes from fear, the other intention comes from love. One creates painful consequences, the other creates joyful consequences. And you make the choice. You don't get rewarded for one or punished for the other. It's your life. You choose what you do with it. You choose the experiences you will have with it. And as you become more and more aware of this and use it more constructively, you become more and more free of fear, more and more love begins to fill your awareness. And that's how you become loving, step by step. You use your emotional awareness you use your volition. You ask your intuition. And your non-physical teachers will not tell you what to do. Don't think that they're your back door to instant happiness or to instant joy. There is instant happiness, but there is no instant joy. You've got to create it by removing all obstacles within you to it. Your non-physical teachers will always help you to see the experiences of your life in a way that you can use them more constructively. As I've been striving to do, uh, although we haven't spoken of specific examples except a few, but I learned how to do these things from my non-physical teachers, and your non-physical teachers will help you see your experiences in ways that are meaningful to you so that you can use them to grow in the ways that the healthy, the loving parts of your personality already are. Thank you so much for being such a beacon of light. And, you know, a big part of me wishes that this knowledge or this wisdom was accessible to more people on the planet, because I feel like it could solve so many of the problems that we have on a global are level. You not, are, are, are you not doing this now with your podcast? I am. By I as a guest. Exactly. So give yourself credit for that. Thank it's you. a beautiful thing to do. You Thank could you. be having a podcast. You're welcome. You're welcome. Appreciate yourself. You are, you have an open heart, which means you are willing to look at the parts of yourself that do not feel open. You are willing to share how to move in that direction with others. You are given great blessings in life and you are using them to share with others what is most beneficial to share rather than what is destructive to share. I appreciate you very much for this podcast and for how you're using it. And I thank you for inviting me to be on it. It's such an honor to have you on the show. And I really thank you from the bottom of my heart to you know, spend the time to be here and to share your your knowledge, your wisdom with us. It's just been it's just been a wonderful experience.
You're welcome. And by the way, you can do something. Uh, if we just started a program yes. uh, last month, it's called An Evening with Gary Zukav. Once a month, you have to pay for it. It's a subscription. I, I think it's $37 US a month. And I love it. I uh, have a Zoom call like we're having now. And uh, I talk about something that feels appropriate to talk about in the moment, like we're talking about some things now. And then I do my best to answer questions and for people to share what their experiences are. And we can see how those experiences apply or how you can apply what you're learning to those experiences. So if you'd like to do that, please join me. I love it. I love using Zoom this way. So, so And uh, they can find that on seatofthesoul.com, right? Yes, you can. Just 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 go to the uh, menu and, and you'll see it. You, you, you'll see it in there. Perfect. Uh, I'll make sure I mention that in the description. And I also want to add to that and let everyone know that if you don't have the Seed of the Soul yet, I really recommend that you get it. It is filled with gems of wisdom. And um, you can find that on wherever books are sold and also on Gary's website, seedofthesoul.com. Uh, you'll also learn about his other books over there, as well as his courses, including the one we just talked about. That's right. right. And by the way, yeah. there is a, a an anniversary edition of The Seed of the Soul, which you showed was the original. The anniversary okay. edition has the same book in it, but it also has a very big study guide section that I wrote. For every chapter in the book, oh, The wow. Seed of the Soul, okay. there is a study guide chapter in the 25th anniversary edition. And for every study guide chapter, there is an online extension uh, that you can go to. And all of this is free. And this, this is all part of the book. So if you have the original edition, uh, that's a lovely uh, that's a lovely edition. The actual content yeah, of the book I is the same. I bought this about 20 years ago, I, if you recognize that's it. Right. <laughs> so, that's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yes, I got to get a, well, a, a copy of the new one, the latest edition. Oh, well, tell me what you think about the study guide when, and, and see if it helps you. It's a I joy will. to be with you. Thank it you so much. Is.